Hello and welcome to our lecture course, Foundations of Deep Learning. My name is Frank Hutter and I have the professorship for machine learning here in Freiburg and will be teaching many of the lectures in this course. I believe that this is a really exciting course and that you can get a lot out of it, both for your projects and theses and for the time after your studies. Today, we'll get started with an overview of deep learning. And in this first video, I would like to provide some motivation for studying deep learning. So let's dive right in. Motivation for deep learning. Deep learning is arguably the key technology of our time. We hear about AI in the news all the time. And in most of these cases, this is about deep learning. This course here is about the methods underlying all of that. So it should be super relevant to you, regardless of what you actually want to do after your studies. Now, deep learning has revolutionized many different fields. And the first example I give for this simply has to be natural language processing and the incredible success story of ChatGPT. At the core of ChatGPT is GPT, more precisely a numbered version of GPT, such as GPT 3.5 or GPT 4. And this GPT is simply a deep neural network trained to predict the next word in a sequence. ChatGPT then also does some fine tuning to align with human values, and, and we'll discuss that later in the course. But the core next word prediction task is really just the one visualized here. Given a prefix of a sentence for each word here in the English language, predict the probability that this word would be the next in the sequence. So technically, you actually make these predictions for subword phrases, but, but that's a detail. And, and in this course, we learn really all the details about all the building blocks of the deep learning that you need for this. Now, the amazing phenomenon of GPT is that the neural network, by simply training to predict the next word as well as possible, learns to understand the world to some degree. And and this GPT can also understand any language, like English, German, Mandarin, etc., but also languages like Python or CSV files or PowerPoint and code. And also by some fine tuning based on a few examples, it can learn to use tools with a given API. So GPT is really a general purpose technology, like the internet, and its universal interface makes it extremely pervasive and disruptive. Now, deep learning has also revolutionized generative AI at large, not only in the NLP domain. So generative AI algorithms are now yielding excellent results in generating all kinds of different types of output, such as images and video. And this image on the right here generated by Midjourney um, based on this um, text portrait and paint drops, um, but it, not only images and videos, also poetry, music, speech from text, um, maybe speech for um, a particular person when, when you have some, some speech samples from them, code, and even new proteins. And, and once more, actually these types of methods are very pervasive and disruptive with huge implications on society, both good and bad. Now, another important success story of deep learning is that it has revolutionized the field of computer vision. To give you an example of why this is important, take the problem of self-driving cars. A key computer vision technology behind this is semantic segmentation, which aims to come up with the class of each pixel in an image, such as you know, road and car and bike and bike rider and so on. And semantic segmentation is one of these problems that is um, completely dominated by deep learning. And so in general, a good indication of progress in the field of computer vision is how well different systems do on standard challenge tasks. One such task is a so-called image net large-scale visual recognition challenge, ILS VRC, which aims to recognize objects in images. And as we see here, starting in 2012, when deep learning was applied to this challenge, the classification errors very quickly improved 
to the point where in 2015 they were actually lower than that of a human. Computer vision is not the only field that has been revolutionized like this. The same happened in speech recognition, which is of course also very relevant in our daily lives. When you speak to your smartphone, it can actually really recognize you now. And this enables all kinds of applications, such as the Skype auto translator, which recognizes your speech and then uses an internal machine learning system and then generates speech in another language. So you can actually directly communicate from one language to another based on these speech recognition systems. And so for speech recognition, there's this benchmark switchboard. And on this benchmark, performance has been kind of stagnating for 10 years in this phase here. But then based on deep learning, um, performance really quickly improved, just like for computer vision. And um, we now have really strong speech recognition systems. Another field where deep learning is being used very heavily these days and has a, had a lot of success stories is in deep reinforcement learning. So the combination of deep learning and reinforcement learning has, for example, achieved superhuman performance in games such as Atari here um, and Computer Go, where um, yeah, deep learning systems have actually beaten the world's best Go player. Next to these success stories, deep learning is also really popular because it can be seen as a different way of programming. So notice that in some of the problems we just discussed, like face recognition and playing Atari games, we don't actually really understand how the human brain solves these problems. And we actually wouldn't be able to write down an algorithm for solving these problems that works as well as the human brain. So we can't explain how to solve these problems, but actually given enough data or experience, we can actually learn to solve these problems from data. And that's a pretty powerful concept. Now, and then importantly, when the task changes, we don't need to do any more coding. We don't need to change programmatically an algorithm, but we simply retrain on this new data. For example, let's say we now want to recognize speech, not in German, but in English. Then we simply use different data, namely English spoken language instead of German spoken language and we don't need to change the underlying learning system. In contrast, if we were to try to write this as an algorithm, we would have to encode the concepts of German and English grammar, and the end result would be highly complicated. And the fascinating thing is that these days, these systems solely learn from data can actually do better than previous attempts of encoding grammar rules and so on. And when we learn a neural network from data, this yields a deterministic function that we can apply to arbitrarily new data, just like a programmed algorithm. So you can actually see learning as a different way of programming, a different way of coming up with an algorithm, not by programming the algorithm, but by learning it from data. And that's a pretty powerful concept. Another reason that deep learning is very popular, particularly in AI, is that it allows a lot of branches of AI to converge. Deep learning is now the principal approach in many different branches of areas, such as computer vision, speech recognition, natural language processing, and also a lot of different problems of robotics are tackled with deep learning. Importantly, the same general techniques of deep learning apply in all these different fields, and there's amazing potential for cross-fertilization because all these different fields have actually been drifting away from each other for many decades. And now that the same deep learning techniques actually apply in all these different fields, there's a convergence again. And we are all starting to speak the same language again. For example, in Freiburg, there's a close collaboration between different professorships now, including machine learning and representation learning, computer vision and robotics and neuro robotics and robot learning. And all of us are now speaking the same language and can actually have joint reading groups and different collaborations where we work together. And it's very easy to just apply types of deep learning methods that are developed in one field and apply them to the other field and really have some cross-fertilization and synergies between these different fields. So this is a very exciting time to be in deep learning because it applies to so many different problems. There are also some further reasons for the popularity of deep learning. One of them is definitely that you can quite quickly get to a point where you get good results for some problems. 
In particular, deep learning can handle raw data, such as raw images, raw speech, raw text, and so on. You don't need to come up with specific features for these different types of raw data anymore. And so you don't need a domain expert, a computer vision expert, a speech recognition expert, and so on, in order to actually apply deep learning to these fields. But you can instead actually directly work with a raw data being a deep learning expert. And one of the reasons that this is possible is that there are actually very well engineered libraries, such as TensorFlow and PyTorch, that handle the complex underpinnings of deep learning, such as backpropagation and so on, that, that we'll see in the course. You also need very little machine learning knowledge to get started, because there are lots and lots of example codes on the web. So you can just download some convolutional neural networks, for example, that work well on images. And if you have data, then you can fairly quickly get going. So if you're a hacker, you can just use deep learning quickly. And this really opens up machine learning to a whole other class of people who hadn't actually looked at machine learning before, it, because it was too complex and too opaque. And I should note that while this is a very tempting way of interacting with deep learning, if you're non-expert, um, to just download some piece of code and run it, this also comes at the risk of having no clue what's actually happening under the hood. So in order to prevent this, in this course, we will actually instead focus on foundations, really understanding what's going on in order to be able to dig deeper. But still, it's important that um, deep learning is often easy to use for people, and that is what makes it um, quite popular um, for um, the general public. Another reason that deep learning is popular in the media is this notion that it works like the brain. However, this, this is actually largely hype. It is true that there are some analogies between deep learning and how the brain works, but there's also a lot of different differences, than, uh, more differences than similarities. And as experts, we should take a clear stand and just say standard deep learning does actually not work like the brain. A final reason that deep learning is very popular is that its underlying neural networks are really flexible. And this allows you to apply them to all kinds of different data um, and all kinds of different tasks that it would have been very hard to apply standard machine learning to. And we'll actually see details about this in a later video. Now, this brings us to the end of this video. And at the end of each video, I'm going to leave you with some questions for you to answer yourself or discuss with friends. And I strongly encourage you to take the time to really answer these questions for yourself before continuing um, with um, free, um, for the videos in order to activate the material that you just learned so that it really sticks in your mind. And these questions, they'll take different forms, including pure repetitions, applications of what you just learned to a new problem, trying to do some derivation, or trying to relate what you learned to some problem of your interest. And we'll also use some of these questions directly as questions in the final exam, so there's another motivation for you to spend some time with them. For this video here, I would like to leave you with these questions to think about, and I encourage you to now pause the video and engage with these questions, and I'll see you in the next video. Thank you.